So it's my great pleasure to have Christoph Heitz here, who's actually um, the president of the board of the Data Innovation Alliance, as well as being a professor at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And today he's going to talk about group fairness, refocused, and particularly on assessing the social impact of machine learning systems, which is going to affect us all in the future. So welcome, Christoph. Okay, so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Thank you for uh, preferring this talk to, uh, to a nice dessert and coffee outside, <laughs> but uh, happy to have you here. Okay, group fairness uh, refocused. Yesterday we had, uh, we had two workshops actually in the morning and in the afternoon about responsible AI. Um, both in both workshops, fairness was, uh, was a big issue there. Uh, and um, what also yeah. became apparent is that uh, one of the major uh, challenges uh, when dealing with, with algorithmic fairness or uh, AI fairness is how to measure fairness, how to, how to um, operationalize this concept of being fair. And this talk is about fairness. Uh, this talk is about how to do that actually and we, uh, we developed a kind of a structural um, and, and a systematic uh, way of, of talking about that. And in and, uh, uh, we will see that it relates very much on this aspect of what is the impact of decisions that a system might do, might make uh, on the life of people. And then this is what we try to systematize. So impact assessment is the topic here. Uh, we'll see, and then these are the three, uh, three steps that I want to go through with you. So first point, uh, I'll... Uh, go back to the idea of group fairness, of what is that exactly. And we'll see that uh, at the end it will come out, is it's like uh, equality of expected impact, this is the first message. Then I'll uh, make a review of standard fairness metrics and uh, show that they indeed do that, uh, but in very with very specific assumptions. And that the, the, the framework that we developed is a bit more general. We'll see how this helps us tackling problems that are a bit more complicated than the simple textbook things that you find today. And then a few words about how to systematically derive uh, something that, that is called a utility function. I'll explain what it is um, in a concrete case. OK, what is algorithmic? fairness or algorithmic unfairness. And here's a, here's a definition of one of the most important books on fairness, on machine learning and, uh, and fairness. Uh, unfairness is a treatment that systematically imposes a disadvantage on one social group relative to others. So three ingredients here. Social groups we are concerned with, comparing, comparing social groups, men and women, uh, black and white. Uh, disadvantage, it's about disadvantage, and it's about something like a systematic disadvantage. So, um, unfairness is uh, used or uh, this, uh, very synonymously with discrimination and algorithmic bias. It's not exactly the same, but if you are not deep into the topic, just take that as pretty much the same. If you are deep into the topic, you're, you know what the differences are. Systematic, uh, uh, systematic uh, disadvantage, what is that? Here's an example. Let's say we have two groups of both three people, group A, group B, um, and everybody of those, those uh, individuals gets some benefit, and let's be that a benefit in, in euros. So, Anna, Anton, Adriana, uh, they get different amounts of euros. Um, Berta, Basti, and Barbara as well. So, now what can we see here? Uh, we see two things. Uh, there's a, a, a huge discrepancy within one group. And there's also something that, that looks like, well, the second group does get a bit more, right? So <laughs> there's, there's a kind of systematic effect here. And uh, group fairness uh, is basically concerned not about this discrepancy here, uh, this uh, within group um, differences, but with systematic differences between groups. So and if, we, if we observe something like that, and it's typically observed on the average level, uh, then we would speak of a systematic uh, inequality. And this is, uh, this is what group fairness is about. How can we systematize this a bit? So uh, the application scenario is typically we have a decision system, and this does not need to be a technical thing or, or an AI thing. Let's say a, a decision system uh, that takes decision on individuals, on many individuals in a, in a society, and uh, we assume we have two groups, A and B. Each individual decision creates an individual 
benefit or a harm, but for the sake, uh, let's say harm is a negative benefit, so I'll speak of benefit in the, in, in the uh, future. So group fairness means we want to have equality between the average benefit for group members of group A uh, and the average ben benefit of for members of group B. This is basically what what is meant with that, and uh, let's say the the, the, the the literature is quite uh, quite consistent in that. Now we can we have formalized that a bit uh, into the principle of equal expected utility. So what you see here is the equality. Uh, and and some the mathematical form of an expectation value. So we have something like a benefit. So U uh, stands for the amount of benefit, and this is called utility. This is a term uh, borrowed from from econometrics. Uh, you might know that. So the utility of having uh, of a decision uh, is an expectation value. So if you should just choose randomly a person, there will be a, a specific uh, utility. But if you choose many of them, then the expectation value is uh, identical to the average. And we have an indicator of the group. This idea uh, has a foundation, a philosophical foundation, um, and uh, this and in in the field of, of uh, in a philosophical field which is called distributive justice. Uh, fairness has to do with justice, and there is a philosophical foundation that we base our work on. Actually, in group fairness is actually one application of this principle. Now, uh, we are not talking, so this, this was kind of an excurse into, <laughs> into philosophy, if you want, if you, uh, into this question, what, what, is, uh, what is fairness? So, and, and this is basically what we understand uh, in, uh, as fairness in this form of group fairness, which is the dominant uh, um, paradigm uh, for fairness uh, in, the, in the, let's say, AI and machine learning uh, field, um, uh, how, how we understand that. Now, a bit more technical, we are, we are basically talking about prediction-based decision-making. So, context AI, context of machine learning, we make a decision, and the structure, let's say the simplest case is we take a binary decision, a yes-no decision, uh, based on some unknown variable uh, that is typically called Y. Uh, here's an example. Uh, let's say an uh, uh, example is promoting someone uh, to become a team leader in a company. Right? So the decision is promote this person to a team leader, yes or no. Now, how, how do we make this decision? Basically, the, the most important thing is uh, um, we should say, <laughs> we should promote if we are sure that this person will be a good team, team leader. So we'll be su successful as a team leader. Uh, but this is something that we don't know, actually. We, we make a projection or uh, we... Um, predict that somehow. The ideal decision here is, is the decision was very simple. So if, if uh, y is 0, then I should not do that. If y is 1, then I should promote. Very easy, right? If this is a, 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 guy, uh, a person who would not be successful, then better do it not. So now, um, it's a, as easy as that. In practice, the problem is that this, is, this y is often not known. So uh, what we do is we predict that. We create a prediction model, we take some data of this person, push it into a predictive model, there's a prediction of the future success, and based on that prediction we take a decision. So this is the standard form of uh, how an AI system works. Okay, now... Um, How uh, is fairness measured now in classical in the cl classical fairness literature? And I just explained that uh, before I then uh, yeah. um, tell you that this is let's say somehow restricted and limited, but we'll have this generalization. Then. So standard fairness criteria are based on on a decision outcome matrix. And what you see here in the in the, the right is this matrix. So uh, each individual might have uh, a value of i value of zero or one of one, or uh, y equal one. And then each individual can get a positive decision or a negative decision. So if you are one individual, you will end up in one of those four quadrants. And there's a specific probability of, the, of, of, of that. Uh, Ideally, we want to have those probabilities zero, uh, but in practice, this is not the case. So we have some misclassification. Uh, so, but, but the sum of those probabilities is one. Uh, and uh, if you look at, at, at standard, uh, 
standard fairness criteria, uh, then we see that this is very much uh, linked to that. For example, statistical parity. Statistical parity is a criterion, a fairness criterion that is widely used that says the probability of a positive decision should be equal for uh, members of uh, both groups. Now, this is based on, on, uh, on a probability of a positive decision. And as you see here in the matrix, this is just a sum of P01 and P00. So it's kind of calculated from that matrix. Or um, an equality of the true positive rate. Another fairness criterion is the probability that someone gets a positive decision given that it, it will be a successful leader uh, here. And uh, this also can, ex can be expressed by those numbers. What we see here is that standard fairness criteria are counting numbers in the form of probabilities. They are counting cases. Um, they are not directly measuring something like an impact or like a benefit or like a harm. So in a sense, the question is, hey, what, uh, it's not exactly what we are after when we look for disadvantage. Right? So, so we, we need to specify what a disadvantage is and maybe it's not it, it might be different, and and um, what how we can formalize that a bit. So we have those four di four different decision outcomes here. Now each outcome leads to a specific utility for you as an individual, right? A, a specific benefit or harm, uh, and this can be uh, can be specified by such a utility matrix. So U zero zero is the benefit that you have. Uh, if you have a y equals zero and get a negative decision, right? So, so all those four cases are have associated um, um, utilities. Now, just a simple example: assume a university admission problem. So, students apply, or future students apply, uh, and then the, uh, this university needs to decide uh, uh, which of those students should be should be admitted. It's only a small small part of them can be admitted. Um, and uh, so what the, the decision here is um, about admission and what a un university will do typically is to, 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 to try to predict whether a specific student is a will, will be a good student in the future, when it, when it will be there. So. And then it selects the best students and, and gives a positive decision. Assume now that, that uh, this is a, a, a totally renowned university. Uh, a private university will take care that everybody who is admitted uh, also passes that and gets the degree. And it's so renowned that when you, once you, you, uh, you have a degree of that university, uh, you, you will have a good life. Right? Something like that. Uh, this is the situation. Now, uh, what would the utilities be here? for those uh, four quadrants. And it's fairly simple actually here. So if you are not admitted, you have no benefit. Uh, actually, if you are admitted, you have a benefit, which is, uh, let's say, one here, um, if you're a good student. But you also have the same benefit if you're a bad student, because the system will, will, will give you a, a push you through, through the system anyway. OK. Uh, very easy, this, is, this would be utility matrix. But what we now see is uh, that, hey, if we want to uh, calculate something like an average impact, we have to, to, to go over all those cases for an individual. And this is, uh, this is what we can then express by an expectation value here. You have the decision matrix, which is a property of the prediction algorithm, basically. And we have the utilities, but those are very, very distinct uh, features and then we should keep them apart. So this is the formula that you may hear. Uh, and the message here is measuring impact requires a combination, basically. OK, now um, let's, let's see how that works out for a standard fairness metric. So for example, statistical parity, uh, we have seen that, uh, how, how that will be can, uh, calculated. The general expected utility, this was now the, the general uh, impact assessment formula here is that. Now, is this the same? And the answer is yes, it is the same, but only uh, under very specific conditions, right? If you set those two U uh, values to zero and the other ones to one, hey, then it's the same. And this can be generalized. So for, for general standard fairness metrics, it turns out that each standard Fairness metric is associated with a, some assumption on the utility matrix. 
a specific assumption, which is typically not explicitly told, uh, but is, it's implicitly there. So um, standard metrics implement exactly this principle of equality of expected impact, but they make a very specific assumption. For statistical parity, for example, uh, we have this utility function. Which means statistical parity, sorry, statistical parity is an adequate metric for assessing fairness if and only if this is, this is, the, correct, uh, this is the correct utility function. But things might be different in other cases. And uh, here's an example, an, another example, where we see that this utility function just is not appropriate. Assume you have a population with, uh, you're looking at people with chronic pain. Assume that there's, there's a new drug on the market who can cure people from this pain, but only a part of the people. Uh, and it, it's related to some genetic disposition uh, that people may have. So it works on, on, on some people, it does not work on other people. But for all people, it has strong side effects. For all. Now, we don't know, uh, uh, this, this, we don't know exactly about this, this, uh, this, this genetic predisposition. Uh, predispos Assume it's hard to find out. Uh, but we can take some data, make a prediction, and this prediction is maybe, maybe right, but maybe also wrong. Now, what happens here? So, and, and the decision basically is treating if this, this prediction is positive. Um, well, how is now the utility function here? And the utility function is zero if you don't get a treatment, you, so, so nothing happens here uh, compared to today. If you get a treatment and you are really, uh, and, and this treatment uh, heals, uh, cures you, then you have, a, 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 let's say, a high utility. But if you are one of those people who has the wrong genetic disposition, the, the treatment will just uh, destroy uh, a part of the remaining uh, health that you, that you still have. So you, you this an, compared to not getting a treatment, is a, it's a negative outcome. So um, when, we, when we are looking at the expected impact of this, uh, this decision system to the individuals of this group, the average impact, then we see that we have to calculate something like that. And this is not identical, for example, to the statistical parity. And it turns out that no uh, uh, classical fairness metric is able to actually uh, 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 is doing this calculation. So there's just, just, just no expect, uh, uh, thing here. So this is missing, actually, in, in the current literature, but, but uh, we, we, we see how it could be constructed. And this is the general solution that we uh, suggest here. So, uh, short pit step, uh, what we have seen, the basic concept of group fairness is this equal expected impact. We have seen that standard fairness metrics assess decisions, uh, but not impact. Uh, this may, may be appropriate, but may not be appropriate in other cases. And we have seen how this general framework works. Now, uh, so this is, this is a one big message. Now, how can we derive a utility function? in practice, and this is one of the big uh, complications that also economists would, say, would, would tell you at the, uh, at the very beginning, it's hard to, to find those utility functions. In the case of fairness, it's actually not that hard. And um, we have some uh, simplifying assumptions that, by the way, are made by all fairness metrics. Utility is equal for all members, not different between individuals. Utility depends only on, on Y and D, and that means we can write it down as such a matrix. Um, now, if we use it as a fairness metric, we want to have some. We, we want to make sure that something like that, uh, this this equality, uh, holds. Now, uh, this m means that we don't need to to know the utility exactly. If this holds, uh, this is e equivalent to to uh, to, uh, to another uh, version of a utility that, uh, that that is multiplied with a factor alpha or or. Uh, um, added with a, with a constant beta. So th th those, those formulations are identical. And this gives us two members at uh, two, two degrees of freedom. Uh, one degree about the, of freedom about the, the unit and the other one about the general level. We don't even need to know that. And this, is, this leads to a, a very simple method of building a utility uh, function. The first, uh, the, the first step is we define a reference case. So out of those four um, possible cases, we say one is a reference case and we assign a utility to zero to that. 
We can do that because it's anyway shifting is, is, is uh, uh, because of the shifting invariance. Then we pick, pick another one and um, uh, give this the value 1 or minus 1, depending on whether it is better or worse for the individual to, to, to land there. And then we just have the two remaining ones and we can give them numbers. But now we have set the, the baseline, we have set the, the unit of utility, so we don't, we don't need to, we, we don't just, uh, we, we just need to, to put that I I into a, a reasonable number between those two. Right, so, so it's very simple and it solves quite a lot of problems that people have in, in practice to solve those um, utility things. Okay, I skipped that, it's part of the paper, but this is the conclusion here. Um, so uh, framework for the impact assessment here in general case, coming back to this original uh, definition of what fairness is, is group fairness, is this equality of expected impact. We have seen that standard fairness metrics do that but under specific assumptions on the utility uh, and practical cases may need other metrics provided by this framework. And we have uh, seen how this utility function can be derived in a practical case by a very simple step-by-step -step methods using this in, in, um, um, in invariability functions, uh, properties of the expectation value. So that's it. Thanks so much and for your attention. Thank you for this <coughs> interesting talk. Um, and uh, I, I agree that uh, most of the metrics are not really designed to, or are not really able to evaluate what they're actually supposed to evaluate. Um, now, one question that I, or one thing that I was stumbling upon was already in, the, in one of the earlier slides where you defined the group fairness always as related to the average. And now, for example, when you have a, a, this gender payment gap, um, and which basically says that the average uh, female gets less money than the average male. To, in, to improve the situation when you're only talking about the mean, is that you could give a billion dollar to a woman and then to one woman and then the gap closes. Is that more fair? I don't believe so. So can you... Yeah. Uh, Okay, you, you, uh, so, so thank you for this question. Uh, and I did a bit of a, of a simplification here in the presentation, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, actually, especially, for example, for this, for this, this, this gender gap, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons, uh, or just the, the alleged reasons why, why we have this gap is that, uh, that women uh, work in, in other professions that are kind of systemica systematically paid differently. And this is a reason for, for having this gap. So what we then typically do is we compare uh, salaries for the same type of job. Let's say we, we say we all, all female engineers uh, compared to all male engineers, and then we are not really willing to accept that, right? So, so the fairness criterion would be we want this equality, but only for a part of the of, of, of the population, and this is the population with the same the same um, profession here, right? Or j same job profile. Uh, this is actually. Um, done uh, and reflected in, in, in the different fairness metrics that you find out, there, there's, there's always a, a kind of a contingency uh, uh, on, on additional factors. I just spared it out because it would have been a bit complicated. But uh, yes, it, it is in, in, in many cases, it's not good just to look at every individual, but basically at individuals who would deserve the safe utility, the same utility, right? So this is how, how, how it's done but uh, you would apply this principle then with, uh, let's say, a conditioned on, uh, uh, all individuals conditioned on having the same profession, for example, or having the same need or having the same uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I can see that uh, with the with your introduction of the utility matrix, you're going to shift the decision, and there is a sort of a needle how far you can shift the decision. After all, 
Um, if you if um, you have one, of sorry, if I, we don't shift the decision. We just shift the way how we measure equality or how we measure fairness. The decision is 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 a, is a different box, right? Is this okay. decision matrix? So you don't influence the decision nope. with this? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, it's just a measuring issue. So yeah. in a second step, you would say, okay, if, if I see this 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 uh, a difference, okay. uh, I would need, to, if I want to have fairness, then I, I need to interfere and this interfere, this is this this what what I I'm doing then is changing the decision okay. afterwards, okay. such that the equality is retained again. Okay. Okay. Good. So uh, the the rest of my question was actually related to the case where you have. Uh, this uh, this factor of uh, of an unfair this, this um, of an unfair outcome being larger than one, minus one, how do you how far would go the needle then? Uh, if you have uh, you have one for uh, you know yeah. fairness uh -huh. and then you had something between minus uh, zero and minus one for yeah. the unfair, yeah. but what if you go beyond minus one? Would the you, fairness is not attached at the, to the utility okay. matrix. The utility matrix is just about the impact, okay. right? And and then okay. uh, we have the the, um, the average impact for one group, the average impact for the other group, and you want them okay. to be the same. Okay. So and, and we do that by manipulating the decision rule, actually. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid that we need to keep the timing between the different groups. So I'd just like to thank Christoph again for an excellent talk. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you.